Well, we are in Genesis chapter 17, so we're making our way through the book of Genesis. Come to chapter 17, and the title of the study is Cut Off in Devotion. This is the fourth meeting that Abram is going to have with the Lord, at least the fourth that's accounted in Scripture. He's 99 years old now. Uh, Chapter 16 happened 13 years earlier when Ishmael was born. 24 years earlier, the Lord encounter, or Abram encountered the Lord there in Genesis chapter 12. Again, like each of these encounters, he's calling him and promising. And now we could say he's reiterating the covenant promise that he has made to Abraham, that he's going to give him a descendant. They'd be numerous in number. Those descendants would inherit the promised land and that this would be an abiding covenant between the Lord and himself and his descendants. A couple of other things are going to happen in this chapter. The, the sign of this covenant is going to be introduced. So in the covenant that God made with Noah, the sign of that covenant was the rainbow. Um, in the covenant with Moses, the Mosaic covenant, the sign was the Sabbath. For us in the new covenant, the sign is the blood of Christ. In the Abrahamic covenant, the sign is the sign of circumcision. Up until this point, it has not been introduced. But now it's going to be introduced, and um, we will read about that. You know, one thing that I found just interesting as we study these types of passages is that the Lord tells us that... Um, Lo, it is written of him in the volume of the book that the prophets and the law, it's all about him. It's all about him. Even chapter 17, where we're reading about an ancient guy named Abram that's going to get a new name called Abraham, and he's going to be told that he needs to circumcise himself, everybody in his household, and all of his descendants. How in the world could that possibly apply to us? Well, you're going to see as we get into the New Testament that all of us who have faith in Jesus have been circumcised by him without hands. So as we go through this, I just want to say this at the beginning because I I want you to stay with me in the study because we're going to see how this whole topic is picked up in numerous places in the New Testament. We're going to read of at least four other places where this is talked about. As a matter of fact, we will find our, our, ourselves in Romans 4 again, where we get a commentary on this whole subject. There's plenty of application for us. Um, let's begin reading there at verse 1, and we'll just read verse 1. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am Almighty God, or I am El Shaddai. El Shaddai, Almighty God, the powerful one. Walk before me and be blameless. You know, this revelation of the Lord as El Shaddai to Abraham is pretty important because he's about to hear something that he hasn't heard in 13 years and that he is going to have a descendant. And that descendant is going to come from him and through his 90-year-old wife named Sarai. And they are past that time of their life. They're past that age when they're going to have children. It's going to be a laughable matter. As a matter of fact, um, the original, you know, on the ground, rolling around, laughing out loud is Abram. And it's going to come when he says, you and your wife are going to have a kid. He, you're going to see it. He falls to his face on the ground and is laughing. This cracks him up, but it's no joke. It's a promise of God. But he needs to see El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? El Shaddai is is a a name of God that emphasizes his power, his ability, his resources. It's used 48 times in the Old Testament, the the, the name El Shaddai, the Almighty One, the All-Powerful One, the Omnipotent One. That is our God. There is no shortage. There's nothing that he is unable to do, even in this circumstance. You know, by faith and patience, we read that the, uh, those that have gone before us have inherited the promises of God. But we inherit promises the same way, through faith and patience. Faith in the Lord, and patiently waiting for him to fulfill them. What Abram is going to do when he falls on his face and begins to laugh, you know, um, before the Lord, 
is that he looked at himself. And he looked at the resources that were around him. He looked at his wife and he said, yeah, this is like, this is not going to happen. I mean, and he's going to offer up Ishmael. Hey, take, consider Ishmael. But you see, we all have to deal with this, right? When the Lord speaks in our heart and he says, why don't you go be a missionary? Or why don't you go into full-time ministry? Or why don't you go share with that lady who, there on the bench who's crying? Or why don't you go to your neighbor and speak to them? And now all of a sudden the circumstances seem overwhelming. Why don't you serve the Lord in this capacity? And we can begin to feel very small and we can begin to point to all the reasons why it won't work. I'm 99, she's 90, this is not what happens. And we begin to look. I'm not gifted, I'm not capable, I don't have the resources. And he says, I am El Shaddai. I'm El Shaddai. I'm not worried about your resources. I'm not worried about what's available to you. You know, we tend to measure the ability of a task being done based upon the resources there. Okay, that makes sense, right? Do we have enough money to buy this house? Do we have enough money to build this building? Do we have enough, you know, manpower to get this job done? And we measure the resources. But we always must remember that when God tells us to step out or to move, that whatever the resources show or don't show, the answer is, yes, Lord, I'm moving forward. And I don't know how that may apply to your life this morning. I don't know where it is that you have heard the voice of the Lord or you're having to trust in the Lord in a particular way. Maybe even by as simply as obeying a commandment that you have not been obedient to and you know what the word of the Lord is, but yet it's going to take so much faith for you to obey and trust that it's all going to work out to his glory and his honor and the ultimate blessing in your own life. God is able. That's the word of the Lord. God is able to show up. But what does El Shaddai say to him? Walk before me and be blameless. This is a, a repeated theme in scripture, isn't it? First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. What does, out loud, what, what does the word holy mean? Separated, right? To separate yourself from other things. In the Old Testament, let's think about this. You went to that temple or you went to the tabernacle if you're in the wilderness and that was a holy building, right? That was a holy structure. What does that mean? It was set apart only for the worship of God. The implements, the cups, the bowls, the knives, the censers, they were all holy. The altar was a holy altar. The clothes that the priest wore, they were holy. Even to this, even the anointing oil was holy. And God gave them the formula for this anointing oil. And he says, but be careful. Don't ever try to make this at home. <laughs> it's not going to go well. That's not something that you're supposed to do. Because this uh, formula. This anointing oil is only for the temple. It is separate. So you couldn't want to give a great gift to somebody and say, hey, by the way, this is exactly the way the anointing oil is made in the temple. If you had any sense, you would have thrown it at the guy and ran away. Or, hey, you know, I know we got a party going on. Why don't I wear the clothes I wear at the temple? Or, honey, our knives at home are so dull, I just decided to bring a few knives home from the temple. They're so sharp. Let's use these for... No. No. But why? Because they are what? They're holy. They're separate. They, they have a, a purpose that is clearly defined, and it's not for us to mix with the common. But guess what? You are holy. I am holy. I am an earthen vessel that God says, I'm going to put my spirit within you and I'm going to use you for my purposes. I'm going to use you for the goals that I have. For the kingdom uh, advances, I'm going to use you. You will be a holy vessel to me. So we are separated by the Lord, but we must walk in that separation. We need to make certain that we don't begin to dive back in and become mixed in with the common things. Doesn't, I don't mean better and nor does the Lord mean better than. It's that we're separate from. And so your life, your speech, your thoughts, the things you look on, 
the things that your hands go to, the places where your feet will take you. All of these things are to be holy and separated. You know, it's sad because many times people associate the, this idea of holiness with harshness or holiness with legalism or holiness with something I don't want to do. You know what the Bible says in the New Testament, 1 John? It says that the commandments of God are not burdensome. So let's just, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to respond out loud. But let me ask you, how do the commands of God feel to you? How do they feel? Do they feel like they cramp your lifestyle? Do you feel like it's a, a burden that you would have to bear? Why is that? Why is it? Well, right at the heart of why we want to be holy is our love for the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And here's the reality. If you look at the commandments of God and it seems like something you're uninterested in or it seems like a burden or something you don't want or it seems like harshness, it's because of your love for the Lord. And that's what needs to be changed. Your heart needs to be changed towards the Lord. And God can do this. You've heard me say this many times, but Christianity is not about just walking out some moral code of ethics to be uh, marked by a particular lifestyle. That's not it. Every religion has that. Okay? What's different is I do this in response to the Lord because I want to be like him. Be holy. Why? For I am holy. Oh, there it is. I'm not trying to be like a book. I'm trying to be like the author of the book. I want to be like the one who created me and fashioned me. And so when the commands come, I can say like the psalmist said in Psalm 119, it's good that I've been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. If going through a trial helps me to understand one more aspect of how I am to live my life, I praise the Lord for the trial. Because that's how important it is for me to live a holy life. And so it's a response of love. And if you are trying to live a holy life and you're not in a relationship with the Lord, good luck. It's like going and kissing a stranger. Very awkward. And so it feels awkward to you to try and live like this because you don't have a, a relationship. And so it feels out of place and it feels strange. Or maybe there's a relationship, but it's like a married couple, been married for you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 50, whatever years, and yet they live like strangers. They're married, they're in the same house, they eat the same food, they pay the same bills, but there's no intimacy there. And it even feels awkward for them to hold hands. They haven't said, I love you, in years. And we can get to that kind of unfortunate place in our walk with the Lord. So listen, as we talk about walk before me, and that's an invitation to be before the Lord, right? That's an invitation of, 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 of relationship. Walk before me. I want you to be before me, um, Abram. And I want you to be blameless as well. So I pray that this idea of being holy is inviting to you, that it sounds beautiful to you. And that if it's a burden to you, then you got to step back and you got to say, why? Because the Bible says the commandments of God are not burdensome. First John, you look it up, I forget where it is, towards the end. And so you have to, you have to develop this in your heart. you got to begin to walk with the Lord. you got to spend time with him. And you got to maybe rekindle this morning that relationship. Let's move on, verses 2 through 8. God's going to remind Abraham of the covenant that he's made with him. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, worship, right, devotion, and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which means exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, which means father of a great multitude. <laughs> you know, as, as Abraham would have walked out of this scene and said, did you have another, another encounter with uh, you know, Yahweh, with El Shaddai? He, yes, I did. And he changed my name. He got a new name. What's the name? It doesn't matter. No, no, really. What's the name? I, it was between me and him. No, it wasn't. What's your name? Okay. The name that he gave me was a father of a great multitude. <laughs> you, you don't have a single child from Sarah. What do you mean father of a great? Well, what is this God doing to you? That he would call you by that name. But you see, the Lord looks 
at Abraham without a child from Sarah and sees what's going to happen. And he believes, it's just as real as if it happened. And boy, that's where we all need to come is when the word of the Lord is spoken. We have the faith to believe it and to hold it as true. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will uh, make many nations of you. And kings shall come from you. All true that all took place. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I'll give you the land and your descendants after you, the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, I will be their God. So the covenant is, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to multiply you, and you're going to have this land. And I want you to walk before me and be blameless. And so his name is changed, and the covenant is reiterated one more time for him. And this is something that is important. Um, what we're going to find, um, and actually, I'll tell you what, let's, where am I here? Well, yeah, I got some notes. I got a scripture reference. It's kind of out of place, but let me just kind of walk into it a little bit, and then we'll, we'll come back and re, retrace our steps. The, the sign that... Um, Abraham is going to be given is that he should have the sign of circumcision. And this is going to be the, the indication. Oh, that's why. Notes are out of order. That helps. Yeah. See, I'm not so bad after all. All right. There we go. So, forget what I just said. Abraham has is, is, is been waiting for this to come up about. But again, through faith and patience. And we too, waiting faithfully and patiently for one of the, the biggest promises we have is what? Is that the Lord is going to come back for us. He's going to return. He's going to take us and he's going to translate us. He's going to translate these bodies. We're going to have heavenly uh, bodies that are suited for that environment. And we will be with the Lord. But you know, some people will look at this and they'll begin to doubt it. But the Lord would say, believe. You know, hold fast. Be found uh, fast. Be found uh, waiting and watching for my coming. So he's faithfully waiting. The covenant is reiterated. Now we get the sign of the covenant. Sorry for the confusion there. Verses 9 through 14. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you throughout their generation. So the Israelites. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house, and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God chose this sign of circumcision to remind them of the covenant that he has made. He wanted them to mark their bodies in a place that would remind them that the Redeemer would come through the line of Abraham, that this seed would come. And so he has them in this very vivid reminder saying, the descendant will come. And so I know it's in our minds, why did he choose that? And that's the best answer that I have. And so because the descendant is going to come. And, um, of course, this comes all the way down to Jesus who comes and is that seed, that promised one who delivers. And so this is a physical thing that is happening right here and that is done uh, among the Jews to this very day. But make no mistake about it, it was not meant to only be a physical act. It was meant to be a spiritual connection. What, what is it that the Lord asked of him? Walk before me and be blameless. And then he says, and cut off your flesh. The idea is that as they walk before God, 
and they have marked their bodies, they are now marking their lives in a metaphorical way through circumcision, that it's not a fleshly um, endeavor. And this isn't picked up only in the New Testament. This is something that is established even in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16 says, Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of what? Your heart. And be stiff-necked no longer. So now we see the spiritual significance of this physical act. It's a heart, it's a life that is marked by devotion to the Lord. Or Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. Why? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So to talk about Love and obedience to the Lord around the topic of circumcision is a biblical concept. It's a biblical connection. The the circumcision was a way to mark themselves in their body, but it was supposed to have that impact of their heart being devoted to the Lord and them loving the Lord and that they were living their lives in a way that was compliant They were willing to yield. They weren't stiff-necked. They weren't resisting the ways of God. They were compliant. And so they had cut off the flesh life. We move into verse 15. It says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So he's going to now come to reveal something to him that they probably believed at the beginning, but they definitely do not believe at 99 and 90 that Sarai was going to be the promised, uh, where the promised child would come from. And so her, she gets a name change as well. Uh, I think this is the only woman in scripture who has this, her name changed. And the idea, the basic idea is that you've been a princess of a single family. Now you're going to be a princess of many families. So the same kind of name change significance that came to Abram now comes to Sarai. Now here it is, verses 16 through 22. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Oh, see, now this is different, right? I, I'm sure this is what he believed in the beginning. But after all these years, he's given up on that idea. But now it's stated clearly and explicitly. He says, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abram, here it is, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old. He's 99. Well, if I'm going to have a child, I'll be 100 when, when this guy comes. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So he didn't say any of those things. He's just on his face chuckling and laughing at what the Lord has just said. But he's like, that's not going to happen. I mean, come on. So he says, well, I tell you what, that's a, that's a great part, Lord, that you have. But let me tell you, how about just Ishmael? We already have Ishmael. He's 13 years old. Why don't we just go with Ishmael? Let him live before you. Then God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And since you like to laugh, why don't we call his name Laughter, Isaac? And that's what the name means. You want to laugh? Okay, I'll give you something to laugh about. I'll give you a child, and you shall uh, call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael... I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and got up, uh, and God went up from Abraham. So he comes, he offers. Um, or he tells him he's, Sarah's going to have a child. He says, this isn't going to happen. She's 90. I'm 99. What, I'm going to be 100 years old. I'm going to be having a kid. I don't think so. How about my 13-year-old? Let's, let's just take him. They're like, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this through her. And Ishmael will be blessed. And he's going to have uh, 12 sons. 
Very much like Jacob, right, who has 12 sons. But the covenant, he's going to be a blessed man, but the covenant. What's the covenant ultimately? Who is the promised seed going to come through? That takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where Eve is given the promise that you would have a, a, a seed of yours would come and would crush the head of the serpent who deceived you. In other words, the curse would be reversed. And so they're waiting for that promise. And he says, the promise is not going to come through Ishmael. It's going to come through Isaac. And then it's going to come through the descendants all the way down to eventually Jesus. So no, that, he's going to be a blessed man, but he's not going to be the one through whom the promise will go through. And of course, this is... Um, uh, Islam takes great exception to this and says, no, the promise was through Ishmael. But we have the word of the Lord to tell us otherwise. So the promise of a son named Isaac. Is there something that God is working and doing in your life that just kind of makes you laugh out loud? I think that's not going to happen. There's no way that could ever happen. I mean, the circumstances. I mean, the, the lack of resources, my lack of talent, my lack of ability. This is what, this is, was Moses' problem, right? When God said, I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh, he's like, I can't do that. I've got a stuttering problem. Why would you ask me, a guy who has a stuttering problem, to be a spokesman for you? And what was the Lord's response? Who made your mouth? I made your mouth, and I can put the words I want to be in your mouth. And of course, he says, no, no, no. We'll let Aaron do that. Well, that didn't work out so well. So eventually, Abraham does become the spokesman. But what is it that is causing you to doubt that the almighty God, El Shaddai, can show up and perform what he has promised or what he has called you to? So the announcement comes, the child is going to come in about a year. Look at verses 23 through 27. And here we see Abraham is immediately obedient to the covenant. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham, Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. Here it is. Look at this. That very same day. As God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. And all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So although he laughed, and although he had other alternatives to help God out in what he wanted to do, at the end of the encounter, he was fully devoted to the Lord. And he went and he cut the flesh as a mark of his devotion, as a mark of his worship. You know, this idea that we have in our culture that we should never deny ourselves is not a biblical one. It's not biblical. You don't, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. And yet, that is the calling card of the hour we live in. God would never have you deny yourself. Whoever you think you are or whatever you want to do, don't deny yourself. Indulge yourself or be yourself. But the Lord would say, be my man, be my woman. And Abraham, what I'm going to do, I know you don't want to go through this process, but you're going to go through it. You're going to have a child and you're going to circumcise yourself. And he got up that very same day and did it because he was devoted in his worship and his love to the Lord. It wasn't about him doing what he wanted to do. It was about him walking before God and being blameless. And that same principle is true for us at this very hour. Maybe there's something that you've allowed to grow in your life five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, it would have had no place in your life. That activity, that thought process, that speech, where your feet are taking you, what your hands are doing, you would have never done it and you would have called anybody else who was doing it to repentance and to say there's a better way to go. But now it's present in your life. You remember the promise of God when it came to you, when he called you, and you became a follower of Jesus, and you wanted to be holy because he is holy. 
And you were walking that way, but you know what? Times come along, and now there's some Ishmaels, or there's some Eleazars, his servants that are around you, and those are now a common part of your life, and you're just offering this, these up as substitutions. And the Lord would say to you, no, it's Sarah. He would say, no, I don't want that work of your flesh. I want to do something that's a work of the Spirit, something that is holy to me, something that is set apart for me. I have a plan. I'll bless your descendant, but that's not the plan that I have through whom the seed will come. So maybe today that phrase, the very same day, is exactly what you need. You need to cut that off. You need to circumcise what your eyes are seeing. You need to circumcise what your ears are hearing. You need to circumcise what you're speaking. And you need to do it this very same day. Now, as we move, as we close here, I just want to close by a look into the New Testament at how this topic of circumcision is picked up. So in Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, Paul gives a commentary on what we just read. So Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, he's going to talk about this whole event that Abraham just experienced. And so it goes on larger, longer than just this section, but you'll get the idea. And the main point that we're going to see here is that circumcision did not make Abraham righteous. Because he has already been counted righteous back in chapter 15 when he believed. So much earlier, he had already had this experience of being accounted righteous. Now, you know, some 13, 15, 20, whatever it is, years later, now he's going to circumcise. And so the point that he makes is when was he circumcised and when was he accounted righteous? Because some were saying... Well, yeah, you need to have faith in Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised. It's great that you have faith in Jesus, but you know, if you're not circumcised, then you don't get the whole experience. So you've got to be circumcised. So Paul picks it up. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And when was it accounted? While he was Circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Do you believe in the Lord? Then he's your father, Father Abraham. That's why you sing it in Sunday school, Father Abraham and many sons. Though they are uncircumcised, Gentiles, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. And that the father of circumcision, to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So he settles the issue. No, 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 no. That's not how a person is made righteous. You might want to read Acts chapter 15 on this point as well. But then Paul addresses this same issue to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free, and do not become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. So if you want to try and work your way to salvation, and you're going to use circumcision as part of that process, then Jesus is no help to you. Verse 3, And I testify again to you, every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So again, the whole point is we are saved as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the grace of God is poured out upon us, not through the works of the law, not through circumcision. Now I mentioned this next passage and that all of us who have faith in Jesus are, have been spiritually circumcised. So we'll read it here and wrapping up this study. I have one more passage after this and then we're going to pray. Colossians 2 verses 11 
through 13 read like this. It says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So without hands, the work of Christ has circumcised you. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through, the faith, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you're living a fleshly life, sinful life. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So Jesus has circumcised every believer spiritually. That is, he has removed their flesh. That is, he has removed their sin. And so every man, every woman, every Jew, every Gentile, everyone who has put faith and trust in Jesus Christ has become circumcised by him. So when Jesus says, lo, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, even chapter 17, which seems kind of very, you know, um, irrelevant to our lives in Christ. And yet it is. And I close with this passage. Here's the whole matter. First Chronic, uh, Corinthians 7, 19. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. What's that? I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. What God had said to Abraham, God says to us. He was circumcised in his flesh. We have been circumcised in Christ. But how we live is the same way. We walk in holiness. We cut off, uh, we circumcise our eyes. We circumcise our hands. We circumcise our ears. We circumcise our hearts that they might be loyal to the Lord in love. Again, I close just saying, if you're in a place where you're like, yeah, but that's not what I want. I don't want to live like that. Why don't you want to live like that? What is it that you find in Jesus Christ that is so offensive? What is it in his love and his kindness that he would come and he would bear your guilt and shame, my guilt and shame on the cross and die a brutal death that he might save us and take us to the Father. What do you find so offensive in Jesus? That he asks you to walk before him and be blameless? You know, sin and the pleasure, pleasure of it is momentary. It's pleasurable for a season, but in the end, what it reaps is death. And you are exchanging a life of fullness based upon the wisdom you think you have that's better than God's. And I would say, humble yourself. Let your heart be humbled before the Lord. You fall before him and say, God, humble me. Give me a heart and a mind that wants to follow you. And then rise up that very same day and obey the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your truth. That you would ask us to walk before you is more than any of us would ever deserve. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us and you are calling us. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not love you and does not love your ways and does not want to look like you when it's all said and done by living a holy life, I pray that you would convict them right now in your grace and your mercy. You would just shower them, Lord, with the reality of your love.